Welcome back to another episode of Beyond Rockets. Today I talk with Honeyblood Art, a multidisciplinary artist connecting the community with art. Thank you to our guest, Fractal uh, Brewing Project, for allowing us to use this space to record this episode. Uh, first off, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talking with me. Can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, thank you so much for having me and for reaching out to me. I really appreciate that. And thank you to Fractal for having us and letting us use this amazing space. I appreciate that. Um, what was your question? <laughs> uh, can you in introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. Tell us a little, 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 little bit about uh, Honey Blood Art. Yeah, so my name is Jesse Andrews, and I grew up in Athens, Alabama. Um, Honey Blood Art. I'm trying to think of how to connect it because <laughs> there's never really... I, I really hate that question. There's never been a disconnect to me of myself and art that I create just because I've always been a creative person and I've always made things. Um, even when I was really young, I was like painting murals on the wall <laughs> in my bedroom and in my bathroom. And so I don't really necessarily see it a, a, as like, two separate again, things. Yeah. I just see it as like I am honey blood art. And, and that's kind of maybe why when we were talking earlier before you started recording, I don't necessarily see one consistency in, in my, I don't see what I specialize in. You yeah. know, it's just like, I feel like I am this creative person capable of like multiple different styles of expression and art. So specifically, I guess, Honey Blood Art, I started painting abstract art and sharing it publicly on Instagram about three and a half years ago. So honestly, not that long. Um, and I really just did it because I don't know, like, I, I don't know, like, it's just a part of who I am to express myself and to, like, I constantly have to be doing something interesting mm -hmm. if I'm not, like, I'm not one of those <laughs> types of people who can just sit down and watch TV all yeah. day or, like, not do something, and so for me, it was kind of this way of just not only expressing myself, but also just kind of, like, meditating, you know, yeah. like, it, it started off, I would just sit in, in my room and, like, paint on the floor and that was my time to kind of pause out from this stressful day to just be present and to not even think, not even think about what is the goal. Am I going to sell this? Who's going to see it? It was just to kind of create whatever you thought of and just kind of put it on paper or put it on some canvas or whatever means at which you decided to paint it. Yeah, just kind of transmute it, like get it out. So you, you mentioned that you've been painting and doing creating art for a long time. Uh, did you go to school and continue uh, and continue your education in art or is your background in something else? And is, is that was Honey Blood Art a beginning of like a passion project and something you were doing on, on the side? Yeah. Um, so no, I did not go to school for art. I went to school for nutrition and I, I thought that I was going to be a life coach and a health coach and I've studied permaculture and yoga and gardening and all <laughs> of that. So I, I thought that that was going to be what I ended up doing for, you know, for my career and still maybe somehow that might end up tying ideally in the future. But no, I actually hated um, any sort of like art class that I ever <laughs> had with the exception of my third grade art teacher, Mr. Brawley, who was just phenomenal because he really showed me that there weren't these rules associated with art and um you know I appreciated that because I don't think that there should be I think art is just a genuine expression but then I ideally you try to tie it to like the highest quality version you can you yeah know, I don't think I really am answering your question there but um yeah <sighs> I, I don't I don't know what your question was exactly <laughs> so you mentioned that you were going to school to do nutrition, but you were doing the art on the side, mm -hmm. and you were kind of, is all this, is all like, as soon as you started kind of doing the project for Honey Blood Art, and you kind of like began that Instagram oh, yeah. and began that process, did you just sell your art through Instagram, or did you go to like little pop-ups like Low Mill and downtown, or mm -hmm. how did you kind of get your word out and, and, and your name out in the public? Well, honestly, Instagram was the way that it kind of blossomed. And uh, I did go to Low Mill, I think, um, let me move a little closer to the mic. <laughs> I did go to Low Mill and set up at the artist market two to three times, which okay. was great, but it didn't necessarily, I didn't really sell anything there yeah. that much. And, and honestly, I didn't really like going that much because I didn't like to just set up and have to be there for a specific amount of time, mm -hmm. even though I really appreciate Low, yeah. Mar uh, Low Mill and I think it's a, a great community thing. Um, I just started to share on Instagram and then I think you know, luckily it piqued the interest of some people and then people would buy it and they would share it. And I, I think kind of like what we were talking about earlier, just word of mouth has been the most phenomenal thing for me. And so I have had an Etsy and I have had like separate ways of selling my art, which probably I will go back to in the future. But 
I haven't really been able to make enough art to where I have inventory or stock right now. It just kind of all sells on Instagram when I well, make it. Perfect. <laughs> this is exactly what you hope yeah. for, I guess. <laughs> so I'm like, it kind of saves me time. Yeah. And, and then I just get to connect with people because I usually, if it's local, like we'll deliver it to someone's house and then we chit chat and I end up forming like a little connection with them. So I, I like to do it that way. So at, at the beginning of you kind of three years ago when you started this process, um, you were really just kind of creating pieces that you thought were um, you, creating pieces that you really wanted to create. It wasn't that people were reaching out to you and you were creating prod pieces for them, but as you slowly kind of continued your growth, you've been able to be commissioned by people to create projects. Do you often now find yourself kind of busy with the commission side, not being able to create whatever comes to your head? Yes, I do, and that is honestly my goal. I just finished this large project in January, and now I'm finishing some commission pieces, and the goal is once I finish these commissions to just have a period of time where I can just develop my own collection that I want to make, because I haven't, yeah, I haven't done that in, in quite some time, So, which I love commissions. I'm very thankful for them, but there's something different in making something for somebody else and making it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, but also something that I just started to do, and I haven't really promoted it or shared it yet, but is intuitive paintings. So someone will come to me with, I've done it off of birth charts before, which I know maybe kind of sounds mm. a little bit weird to some yeah. people, but they'll give me their birthday and their time. And then I read about their birth chart and then they tell me a little bit about themselves and they give me a budget and I create a piece based off of that, completely wow. inspired by them and their energy. Um, which is really fun to do. So when you first started uh, three years ago and you were kind of just getting into it and you were kind of uh, trying to sell your pieces through uh, Instagram and Etsy and all these different means, was it successful right off the bat? Uh, right off the bat or were people kind of, were what you, what you were creating was something people haven't seen in Huntsville and it took a little bit to kind of catch fire? Honestly, I do not know the answer to that. <laughs> I just know that I didn't in the beginning... Now, you know, now that I have, I don't think that I have any sort of following or anything really, but now that some people have bought art and maybe someone knows who I am, it's different. There's like more, I, I feel like I have more responsibility as an artist than I did in the beginning. And in the beginning, I just completely shared from my heart. Yeah. And, and also I think on Instagram, I was very open with my personal life at that time. Not personal necessarily, but I would share things about like yoga and nutrition as well. So... I connected with people not only through art, but just through, I guess, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, but now, I don't know. Now it's kind of a little more pressure of like, do I need to curate? Because people something? have like seen your art. You think more is 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 it because your art's more readily available for people to see in the public that you seem like you have to have like a more of a public figure eye to you? Now? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yes, I think that that is a very good way of saying <laughs> it. <laughs> like, there's more pressure because yeah. I'm seen now. Which, I mean, like, I, I guess as you've continued to grow over the last three years, you've been able to really kind of been out there in the public with some of your pieces. And, like, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more specifically about your pieces coming up. But, I mean, you've been able to really curate a collection of art and people might not even realize it's actually you. Um, when you were uh, starting this, w did you jump into it full time? Uh, or were you still doing your own business, other things on the side? Mm -hmm. and, or, do you, or do you do it full time now? Or I how do does that process? I do it full time now. And I'm so happy to say <laughs> that because I've always wanted to just fully focus on what I'm passionate about, you know, and I've, I've always been kind of like scared to dive into it. Uh, so I maintained a part time job for the last three years. I think when I first began, I had a full time job. But then after that, I maintained a part time job doing marketing locally. Um, and then, then I just cut the cord and I was <laughs> like, all right, I'm diving in. I'm going to try and see how it goes. How, how difficult was it to make that decision to jump in? And it was really scary just because, you know, well, for one, I support myself completely. I don't have, you know, I, I live on my own. I don't have a family that's paying my bills or a husband or anything like that. So it was like, okay, it's all on me to make this decision. And it's completely my responsibility what happens. Um, which is like a scary feeling, you yeah. know? And, and secondly, it's like, okay, it's very easy. Well, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's one thing to know that you have a set schedule and you know what your responsibilities are and you know you have to be somewhere at a certain time and you know the chain of command. It's a whole different story to be like, all right, what, <laughs> you know, how do I have this discipline for myself yeah. and how do I set these parameters and what are the goals and what needs to be done? And okay, I report to me. So it's a whole different thing. Um, but it was super scary and I Googled, oh, well, but then on top of that too, I mean, you have like 
societal pressures yeah, of like just people don't expect you to do it full time, I guess. Yeah. Or like, like, I mean, they appreciate your art and they they appreciate the skill that you have or the craft you have or whatever it might be. But people have a hard time nowadays realizing that that skill or that craft can actually be a job. Yeah, and I, I guess so. like jumping into that full time, it's kind of like, did were people helping, like supporting you and like, yes, you should do this. Yes, you should do this. Or were people kind of doubting that you could do it? I didn't really tell anybody, honestly. I was like, this is a personal choice and I don't want anybody else's opinion on it. Um, but pretty much like over the past few years, there have been people who have been like, oh, are you going to try? Are you ever going to try and make it a full time thing? Or there have also been people who are like, you know, maybe you should consider a career in like some completely other field that's not me because they're coming from a fear-based mindset, yeah. you know? And so everybody has their own opinions, which I appreciate, but I was like, all right, this is going to be, this is going to be what I choose <laughs> to do on my own. And it was very difficult, but I was Googling like how to know when to quit your job, <laughs> I swear. And I found this one article. I don't even remember the website, but it was like 50, 50 ways to know it's time to quit. <laughs> and I was like, okay, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Which I mean, I say this now and it's still scary because like, who knows, who yeah. knows what will happen. And like, it's a much bigger of a month to month thing when you're doing it full time. Because I mean, like one month can be fantastic and the next month can dry up, and yeah. especially with COVID and everything that's been happening the last couple of years, the last almost year now. I, know. I mean, it's, you just never know what's going the next month is going to look like. And I bet being a small business owner and being your own boss at that time, at that time, you didn't expect to jump into this and saying, okay, everything's closed now. I know. Well, also something that's kind of interesting is as soon as I took the jump and quit, literally that same day, like three outrageous opportunities came to me that same day. And <laughs> Like I'm not necessarily like a, I don't, I don't know. I'm not like a super, you think it and you manifest it type of person. I think you have to have actions, but I also really believe that when you can close out things in your life that are filling, filling you up, you have room for more things to come yeah. in. Does that make sense? Definitely. Yeah. So you, I mean, over the last, I mean, I guess in the last year you've been able to go full time and COVID happens, you're able to kind of rethink kind of what the, what the art looks like. How has the expansion of downtown and where your art has really seen a lot of um, growth at. How has that uh, furthered Honey Blood Art and the your reach in the community? Mm -hmm. oh, well, I will say that I'm very blessed because I have a lot of good connections and people who have taken interest in my work and who have been, um, who have wanted to be involved in some regard. So I feel blessed in, in that way. And a lot of them happen to be people who are involved in the community. So. Um, so through the opportunities that I've had in the past two years doing public art installations, it's really not only, well, I'll just say that it's completely challenged me. I mean, each project has been so different than what I'm capable of doing in my studio. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, I'm painting outside, so it has to be a completely different type of material. And then for the galactic mural, okay, it can't be wood, which is what I'm used to using. Yeah. It has to be metal. Um, so that's one huge aspect that I love about public art is it is a completely different type of pressure and it it forces you to think differently and it really can kind of like force out some creative juice. Yeah. But it's also frustrating because things happen that you wouldn't expect. <laughs> yeah. Weather like happens. Weather, people are watching you, which is awkward a lot of the time <laughs> for me, you know, because someone wants to talk and I'm just like, you're like I'm trying, me? like I like I have a deadline, I have four or five days and yes. you're like, I, I don't, I, I, want, I want to meet you mm -hmm. and I want to talk to you, but I'm also like, like, can you just like wait one second? Yeah. Well, so actually someone made me a sign. I'll show you a photo later, but it says artist at work. Please do not disturb <laughs> <laughs> accepting tips or yes, something like that. That's, that's a, so, I mean, if people aren't familiar with it, uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the art pieces that you do have downtown? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think researching before the podcast and kind of just being aware of what's going on downtown, I was amazed to see how many pieces of art you actually have downtown. And I think a lot of people would be amazed too, just to kind of realize that like pieces they really love and appreciate are actually done by you. So can you mm -hmm. kind of explain some of your art you have downtown? Yeah. So the first piece of public art that I ever did was an Adirondack chair, which is no longer there, but that was about four years ago, maybe three and a half. But then that led to me doing a door in the Clinton Row color walk. So okay. it's a galactic space door. If you're walking through it, it's on the left-hand side, kind of inset. Um, then I ended up doing that galactic mural off of yeah. Holmes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I ended up doing two poles that are next to Washington Park. Okay. And actually in Washington Park, there are these two benches that I did as a collaboration with Drop Metal. And so they're there. Um, pretty much he made them and I just painted them like color shift. So they're, they're really pretty and they change colors. And then I ended up doing 
I feel like I'm forgetting something, but <laughs> then I ended up doing the seven boxes for Lockheed Martin, which mm -hmm. I just completed in January. Which are all around the big screen park, yeah. right? Okay. And I, and I, well, I don't want to speak out of turn because I don't know if this is necessarily true, but they told me that they were going to kind of create this STEM program for local school children so that they will be able to find the coordinates of the boxes and go out and like hunt for them. Oh, that's awesome. So I don't know if that's going to happen, that's but that would cool. be cool. Yeah. And you, it's interesting to see because it's like, I mean, you, you look at downtown, you look at Huntsville itself a uh, few years ago. I mean, you kind of jumped into this right at the point at which Huntsville's kind of become more um, appreciative of the art and kind of uh, been willing to showcase local artists themselves. Do you think the timing you kind of gotten into this is, was like the perfect timing? Yeah, honestly, I hadn't even really thought about it until you said it, but it does seem to be a really good timing. And yeah, like people are loving the public art here, you know, so like I know for sure that not only other artists want to do public art, but that people want to see it. So I think I think we're growing. And then we have like Arts Huntsville yeah. and people who have the budget to be able to invest into local artists. So it's only going to continue to grow. Yeah, and like in, even at Fractal right here, you did a couple of the art pieces here as well. Help painted them. It's yeah, so I painted. I didn't build it. Yeah. Scrap metal built it's, it, but I did paint it. And it's like right behind the bar. Yeah. Yeah, I so kind like of forgot about that. Pieces like that, I mean, you've been able to really kind of put your touch on in a lot mm -hmm. of different pieces around Huntsville. That like, I mean, people, I mean, like I, I recently walked around the park and was able to see all the different uh, pieces that you did, you've done around the park, around the museum. And it was just incredible just to see just like how little things that like people see every time with those boxes. I mean, those boxes have been there forever, mm -hmm. but people add a, add a little bit of art to it and it kind of brightens up the whole park itself. Well, that's kind of the goal with me because I forgot about this and it's not mine to take credit for, but whenever I managed a nonprofit, we bought a church on Big Cove Road and we completely remodeled the inside of it. Ended up like taking out the carpet and putting AstroTurf in it and hanging things from the ceiling. I'll show you a photo, but it was an insanely artistic installation. And so, that was one of the first things that really, I guess, felt like right. You know, like a lot of people wouldn't want to do it or would think yeah. it was crazy, but I was like, this is so much fun. But like that is what I'm interested in continuing in the future is doing cool collaborations with people. So it's not just me painting something on my own, but it's like me adding a touch to something brilliant that someone already made. I, I really like that aspect yeah. of, and of networking. And it allows you to be able to collaborate. Like you said, I mean, there's a lot of people that are super talented in Huntsville that, I mean, I've I've become aware of over the last over the last year or two years doing this podcast, um, and I I now I appreciate it even more when I see that art in public because I'm like I know the person that actually did mm -hmm. that or I know that oh they're working on this other project and it's gonna be amazing and they're doing it over here and they're doing it over there and it's yeah. just like it's just that appreciation for for art has just become much more of a thing now. Well, that's how I feel too about restaurants. Like when I asked you if you've had Fat Sammy's, to me like not only is it an amazing restaurant, but knowing the people who put the hard work behind it, it's like yeah. that's so much cooler. You yeah, know? for sure. And like there's the, some of my, my uh, best friends over there, and it's like they're just able to create art but mm -hmm. through food yeah and that's like something that i think like i said huntsville is um definitely coming into that in the cusp of being able to see much more of this everywhere through restaurants through food through art through mm -hmm. whatever whatever means it might be as long as we're able to continue supporting them yes you know what for I mean? sure um so moving forward I mean, you kind of mentioned a little bit some of the goals but what are some of the goals you have for honey blood art moving forward in the years to come um so i think the more that i am doing it on my own and thinking about what is possible and the more i'm meeting people and networking and I, I realize that I want it to somehow, I'm trying to think of how to say this, I, I want it to benefit the community past just public art. I would like to be able to create opportunities for, I don't want to say underprivileged children, but for just for people who would not otherwise probably have access to the opportunities. I want to be able to provide creative opportunities for young children. Um, and so I don't know how that will happen <laughs> at this point, but I believe that it is possible. And I want to continue to do public art, but I want to do it really everywhere, but all around North Alabama. So I have an idea. I won't share it on here, but I really want to get sponsored for it. And I'm trying to pitch it to people, but <laughs> it would, it would be really cool. I'll tell yeah. you about it later. <laughs> so how much of your success thus far in this journey for <clears throat> Honeyblood Art would you contribute to being in the right place at the right time? And how much would you contribute to your hard work? I don't know. I mean, I know a lot of artists in Huntsville who have spent years investing into their work and have not really been able to sell that much or who really want public art opportunities. So I don't necessarily know. I, I don't know. I feel like a lot of it is it's good to know people. Mm -hmm. Not that I really knew anybody before, but I have, I'm the type of person who's like very friendly and I'll go out and connect and network and tell people what I'm doing. So I think that that has helped. Um, 
I don't really know about being in the right place at the right time. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that that has to play into it some, yeah. but I don't really know exactly. Y- you've just kind of done the things along the way and along the last three years, it's kind of put you in a good position. Yeah, and, and I will definitely say that something that I think has given me, you know, some, some uh, I don't know how to say it, some good growth has been that even if it's a very difficult thing to do, like I will figure out a way and I will work my butt off and I will make it happen. And I think the hardest thing as an artist, especially doing public art, is like you learn so much from that project and then you look back at it and you're like, oh man, like that could have been so much better, yeah. you know? And and you see it and you wish you would have known that before, but you still have to do it anyways and you can't be scared of not being prepared. Like you can't have imposter syndrome. Yeah. You have to just be like, no, this is my, I'm going to take this opportunity and I'm going to run with it and I'm going to do everything I can. Yeah. And I think about being the small, but being your own like, boss now and doing this full time I mean, you're kind of at the point that you don't have the the opportunities and the chances to not take a chance Mm -hmm. so you have to be able to be willing to no matter what the obstacles might be jump in for it knowing that you might not get another opportunity this month or this week or even in the next three weeks yeah so you should be able to jump in and say okay like i i think i can add my creative touch to this project even if it's i've never painted on this or Mm -hmm. i've never i've never done this but you've been willing to kind of jump in and uh, and create some incredible art that is uh, seen by tons of people every day. Thank you. Well, I want to add on to that. And you were saying that, you know, there might be a period of time where, where I don't have an opportunity or someone doesn't have an opportunity, but I really don't see it that way. I think that if you have kind of a vision or a goal of where you would like to go, even if it's not exact, but you kind of generally know, you create the opportunities for yourself to get there. Like you build the staircase to get there and you don't just wait for oh, like someone's going to ask yeah. me to do this commission. It's like, no, I'm going to build a stair there <laughs> and I'm going to make it happen. Yeah, definitely. And, and that stair might fall down, but I'm going to build one here and make it happen. So like, and I'm not scared I, for I myself. Think that's, I think that's also like interesting too, because like the perspective of like, I like, I can see things in my own life and like opportunities I've been able to get, but I often don't think of the stairs I'm able to create to those opportunities mm-hmm. that were almost non-existent until after the fact. Yeah. And then I, but like often I don't sit back. And I think that's something that I've tried to do more often lately is sitting back and like realizing, okay, like, I am way farther ahead than what I thought, Mm -hmm. but also six months ago, I thought I was a lot farther ahead than I actually am. But I think I would not have gotten to this point if I didn't believe I could get to this point. Yeah, Uh, And I think uh, looking back and seeing those staircases and those opportunities you've been able to create um, that really were non-existent, but you were able just to say, I'm going to make this happen because I think I'm going to be useful for this, or I think I can do this, or Mm -hmm. even if I don't think I can, I'm going to try. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's somebody, I don't know who said it. It's probably like a very famous quote and you might know, (laughs) but it says, whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. And I think that that's a huge thing. Like, if you think that you can do it, you think you can run a podcast, you can get sponsorship, like, you can do yeah. it. Maybe the first person says no, <laughs> but you just keep going. Yeah. Um, what is something that you know now in the business and running it today, day to day and being your own boss that you wish you would have known when you first started? Oh, I wish in the beginning that I would have been more organized because I just never really thought that I would have to do taxes on my art or anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I never really thought anything like that. So um, I wish I would have organized all of my stuff a little bit better. And I'm trying to think of what else. I mean, I really don't know. Each individual project has taught me so stinking much that I always wished that I knew beforehand because yeah. it would have been easier. <laughs> it would have been cleaner. Um, I think one thing that I have learned is as an artist, you have something to offer. And, you know, I have been over, I- I'm kind of scared to say this because I don't want to insult anybody, but I feel like I've been over for people and extended myself past what maybe is necessary and so I think I think you spread yourself thin sometimes when you're a creative person with a lot of ideas and a lot of passion you like try to you know do everything you, yeah <laughs> like I had that podcast you know you do a podcast maybe you have a day job you like try to be in you try to be in good relationships you try yeah. to be you know all these things and I feel like it's good to be focused on a few things and kind of hit them head on, even though I'm still not that way. But <laughs> how can people connect with you and support you in what you're doing? Yeah, people should connect with me on Instagram at, at honeyblood.art. Um, right now, that's pretty much it. I'm working on a website, but it's not up yet. So just find me on Instagram and DM me. <laughs> well, thank you again uh, for sitting down and talking with me. Yeah. It's been awesome learning more about your art and the goals you have moving forward and where you started. And I continue to look forward to the success it will have in Huntsville for years to come. Thank you. I continue to look forward to your success, too. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah. I appreciate it.